morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church on this morning, um, on a day when my shirt is advertising exactly what is special about it in the life of our congregation. This is God's Work, Our Hands Sunday. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But just remember during the course of the worship this morning that God does call us for a purpose. God calls us and redeems us and, and uses us to bring healing, bring help, bring compassion, and bring God's love to the world. And so uh, we begin this worship this morning, and you can stay right where you are, Martha. <laughs> I'm pulling a little switch on you this morning, because in not in your bulletin, uh, but recognizing that this is a weekend of, uh, of remembrance, and a somber remembrance for our nation and for all of us. We will begin our worship this morning with a remembrance and an observance of 9-11. We will ask God's blessing on those who were injured, the families of those who were lost, and on our nation that still grieves, and on the world that still recognizes that nothing has or will ever be the same again. And so let us begin with a prayer and a moment of silence. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this day with hearts that still feel pain over the images and the remembrance of what happened 20 years ago yesterday. Lord God, so many of us can remember to the moment what we were doing during the time that we discovered, heard about, or even saw images of the destruction and the death in New York City, in Shanksville, and at the Pentagon. We remember 20 years of war that followed, all of the lives lost, Lord God. We know that you are a God of peace, a God of healing, and a God of reconciliation. For those with these images and remembrances, and for those not yet born on that day who have heard the stories ever since, we ask that you would create in us new hearts, clean hearts, hearts devoted solely to you. With that being the case, Lord, we pray for peace and justice in our land and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, 
that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of, the, of, of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory, of the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. I'd like to invite forward a child among us to hear about God's goodness. Would you like to come forward and read? in our 
us to express what is in our hearts. We find music comforting. Sometimes it is invigorating, and it certainly helps us to speak things that we have difficulty speaking in other ways and at other times. So we do form our music, especially Lutherans. Lutherans love music. And Martin Luther taught and felt that music was God's gift to us that we raise back to God. Our words and our songs of praise, our words of lament, our words of, of asking God for healing or praising God for healing. When you look through the hymnal, you'll see that at the top of each page, at the top of each page in the, in the part that actually lists our hymns, there are kind of categories that our hymns are, are taken in. And they include things like praise and adoration, holy communion, baptism. There are certain songs that are marked for Lent or for Advent for certain seasons of the year because of the words within those songs or within those hymns. Well, one of the songs that we sing at the later service is called Our God. And there is a refrain that is repeated throughout, over and over again, to some pretty upbeat music. It goes like this. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. And then one of the hymns that you'll find in your green hymnal, it's been around for generations of Christians, particularly Lutherans. It's been in one Lutheran hymnal after another. And it is a song that we sing to raise praise to God. And it's called Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. We sang a couple of verses of it this morning. The first verse goes like this. In light of immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Do you hear the common theme that's present in both of those songs? In both of those songs, we raise up and we praise and we name this God who is great, this God who is awesome. And we thank God for being that awesome God for us. Now, songs like these and the words contained in each of them express a preferred view, and one that is righteous, one that we should raise to our Almighty. Surely there's nothing unfaithful or wrong about simply naming who God is, powerful, omnipotent, creator, redeemer, sanctifier, who blesses the earth by his bountiful goodness and almighty power. Now, there are also popular sayings that also evoke these feelings within us as we name God to be the power in the world and the power in our lives. And they include sayings like, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good, right? And God won't give you more than you can handle. Again, there's nothing wrong or blasphemous about any of these sayings even though the fact is that they clutch singularly as stanchions that we believe about life, shutting out the whole of God's teachings and Jesus' words that can at least be misleading. Oh, there we go. You can hear me better now. In fact, speaking of only one aspect of the providence of God can damage faith because what happens if you believe God is only good, awesome, Powerful and gives you only love and good and healing and wonderful things. What happens when you suffer? When the unspeakable happens? When you're victim to pain, especially chronic, ongoing pain that is psychic or physical? What happens when you endure great suffering on account of your faith? If you believe that God is all-powerful and all-good, but has done or has allowed great suffering in your life, how do you cope with the inconsistency between the nature of God that you have prayed to and appealed to, the God who loves you and desires good life for you, 
when you receive the devastating diagnosis out of nowhere, when unspeakable tragedy strikes. Where is God in those moments for you? You might think, where is God when one after another of your family is taken by COVID? Perhaps you think God is punishing you when your job is lost and you can't find another one and can no longer meet your expenses. So many people in our world today lose faith or refuse to believe when these things happen. They cannot believe in a God that they now see as a God who plays games with our lives. You've probably known people with struggles like that, with beliefs like that. Perhaps you've even thought those things yourself. Because the fact is that our world is full of pain and misery, and none of us is exempt from us, from it. What do you make of God's goodness in the midst of the bad things that happen? It's the age-old question. When God allows bad things to happen to people that we frame as good. It's the unfortunate question far too many in the world ask today. When we see that bad overwhelms good people. When tragedy and evil are all that we can see or experience. When we hear about it day after day after day. And when the existence of a good God seems too distant. It seems like nothing more than a cruel joke to the broken hearted. This was perhaps Peter's problem, when right after Peter himself makes what in the Gospel of Mark is the first human confession of the divinity of Jesus, Jesus delivers the news that the Son of Man will suffer greatly, not only at the hands of men, but at the hands of the leaders of the faith. Not only will the one that Peter has just identified as the Messiah, the anointed one of God, die, he will be murdered by the very same leaders within Judaism who guide the people to faithful living as God's people. Peter's denial, you see, reveals his own prejudice regarding suffering and the power and the goodness of God. The thing is that in the Old Testament, the scriptures that he was raised with, it is revealed time and again that when God called a person to divine service, their lives were often marked by pain and suffering and loss. Remember for a moment the story of Abraham, the father of our faith. His life was not easy. It was marked by longing, temptation, and loss. There are stories of similar experiences for Moses and Samuel, David and Jeremiah, and so many more. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was called by God to bear our Lord into the world, and yet at the very beginning of Jesus' life, Simeon prophesied that her heart would be pierced. And so it was. In the Old Testament and in the New, when God called a person to divine service, their lives were often marked by suffering, loss, and pain. And perhaps that is the reason that so often when those calls were given, when people were called, the first words spoken to them were, do not fear. As Professor Michael Chan of Luther Seminary writes, Truth-telling and faithful living are rarely popular vocations, and they often land even the most eloquent and persuasive among us in hot water and more. The point is not that suffering is glorious or commendable. Rather, it is inevitable, because the world God created has become an inhospitable place for God's word. Think of Jesus' own story in Mark. Immediately after Jesus was baptized, he was hurled out into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. 
mark of Jesus' identity as the Son set him in seed. In direct opposition to the devil, to the evil, to Satan. Whatever you call him, Jesus set himself in opposition to evil and to sin. In both the Advent and, pro and, and uh, in both the Advent prophecies that prepare us for Jesus' coming, and the Lenten reading that we hear to prepare for the passion of Jesus, we hear this passage from Isaiah pointing to Jesus. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Given Isaiah's emphasis on both obedience and suffering, it is no surprise that Christians throughout history have seen the passion and death of the Messiah in this profound text from Isaiah. Right after Peter admits Jesus' true identity, Jesus begins describing his future, his reality. But the words are too much for this disciple. How can the one Messiah be so powerless as to suffer in the way that Jesus describes? How can he die in this way? Peter cannot see the link between Jesus as Lord God of all and Jesus the suffering servant, whose human life will mirror the experience of opposition so often present in those who serve God with the fullness of their lives. For the obedient servants of Yahweh, suffering is the norm, and Jesus is the perfect suffering servant. For those who serve Jesus, who pattern their lives after his, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. While God does not promise that faith will not lead to suffering, he does promise we will never be alone in the midst of whatever the world bestows upon us. Suffering will come, but so will salvation. The suffering is but for a little while. The salvation is eternal. To follow Jesus is to carry a cross. To lose your life for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the world we came to save, for the sake of the sister or brother, will indeed be glorified by God through Jesus. But know that suffering is not for suffering's sake, nor is it endless. That is God's promise to us. That is God's will as he accompanies us. Isaiah writes, But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. So in the context of our lives today, what does all of this mean? To lose your life may not always mean dying a martyr's death. Losing your life for Jesus may mean making sacrifices, real or perceived, with your life for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of your neighbor. It may mean giving up something you desire or need for the life of another. It may mean persevering in the face of opposition, looking not to your own interests, but to the interests of those more vulnerable and needy than yourself. Even if doing so looks like weakness to others, even if the humble choices you make are unpopular by the world around you, in the debate over whose rights are superior to others, what is often lost today is what we do for the sake of the least among us. How do we make our brothers or sisters' life better, more manageable, or safer? How do we look at the judgments of the world versus the judgments of God? Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. 
In Deuteronomy, the Lord God declares that we should love him with all our hearts, our soul, with our complete mind and being. With every molecule, with every strand of DNA, with everything that is within us, we love God. If we obey this commandment, then we love others as God loves us. Unconditionally, without reserve, sacrificially. In his strength, God grants us strength to follow this command even when it is hard, especially when it is hard. For God is always with us, and this commandment stays with us. We love as God first loved us. We sacrifice as God first sacrificed for us. We give our all as Jesus Christ himself gave his all for the sake of the world. In his strength, God grants us strength to follow this command, even when it is hard, even when it is costly, even when it means that we will face opposition, even when we are confused with the happenings of the world around us. Because God is great all the time. All the time. God is great, and in his greatness, in his love for us, he never leaves us. And so we are right when we sing, God, you are higher than any other. God is great and good. Therefore, with God's help, we will love God with all our being, in our public life and in our private life. We will follow the perfecter of our faith, the giver of our lives, the redeemer of our sins and failings. God will enable us in this because God is love, and in love, God is healer, awesome in power, and endlessly faithful. With our whole lives, we will sing, 